In this scenario we have what's called an extended surface and in this surface the uh, heat will be transferred uh, along the axial length of the rod due to conduction and heat will also be transferred in the uh, a direction perpendicular to conduction due to convection into the environment. So heat transfer occurs in two distinct directions. And let's begin by defining a coordinate axis x with x equals zero at the left hand side of the rod and then continuing uh, down the length of the rod. For a sense of perspective I've included differential real short slices of the extended surface from three different perspectives. In this first perspective, conduction occurs into and out of the screen. Convection occurs radially outward from this differential element in the two other directions. So we've got conduction going uh, into and out of the screen and convection coming out the other direction. And now from this perspective we'll have uh, convection coming out that way. From this perspective now the, the x-axis is this way. We've got conduction coming in and conduction coming out. And I'm going to call this Q out convection. I'm going to call this Q in conduction and I'm re representing the flow of thermal energy, and I've got Q out due to conduction. And I'm going to do the same thing from the third perspective, conduction uh, going in and out from left to right, and then convection coming out in the other direction. And I'm going to define, uh, we've got a location x and then a location x plus dx, so the entire length of this differential element is length dx. And what we're going to do is make the length of this go infinitesimally small. So the length of our differential element is as small as you can possibly imagine. Here I've just blown it up for the sake of looking at it, but in reality it's even shorter than that. So our goal here is to somehow come up with the temperature as a function of x. And one of the major assumptions that we're going to make is that temperature is a function of x and only x. And what that means is that we're going to assume that the temperature at the center of our extended surface is going to be the same everywhere for all locations. So the idea here is that we're going to say that the thermal conductivity is so large that we can neglect any differences in temperature between the center and the outer surface of our rod. And there's a few things that we could, you know, that would need to be true for to be able to justify that. One would be a real high thermal conductivity. Another one might be that the diameter or the uh, characteristic length of our extended surface is really small. So that makes it real easy for conduction to occur, a real small conductive resistance. And another thing that might be true or ought to be true is that our heat transfer coefficient is relatively small. So what that does is it allows the temperature of the rod to equilibrate in a direction uh, in our case in the radial direction or a direction that is orthogonal to the axis of our extended surface. For the sake of our analysis let's focus on these two different views and one thing I want you to pay attention to from the outset there, we're going to need to define two different areas so one of the areas is going to be the area associated with conduction so it's the uh, cross-section of the extended surface. So we could see the cross section here, we'll just use A sub C, cross section here, also A sub C, just from a different view. The second area I want you to pay attention to is the outer surface area. So from here we're going to use this surface and that surface area we're going to be uh, dealing with convection from the outer surface and then from this perspective we're looking just at the outer surface in this case we're dealing with a cil cylinder but it's independent of the particular geometry we're dealing with so this area for the outer surface is going to be the perimeter in our case the perimeter would be pi times diameter but I'm just going to leave it as P to make this as general as possible it's going to be the perimeter times dx and the same thing of course from this perspective is the perimeter times dx and as usually the case we're going to start with an energy balance and the control volume incidentally is this differential element itself so we're going to look at energy entering minus the rate at which energy is leaving plus the rate at which energy is being generated and that's going to equal the rate at, at which energy is being stored within our differential element. Now we're going to make the assumption that we're at steady state. We're also going to assume that there's no thermal energy being generated. And what we're left with is the fact that the rate at which energy enters has to equal the rate at which energy leaves. Now energy is entering only due to conduction and energy leaves in two different manners. It leaves, out, uh, leaves due to convection and it also leaves in the actual direction due to conduction. 
So to write it a different way, we've got Q entering due to conduction, Q out uh, leaving due to conduction, and Q out also leaving by way of convection. So one way in and two ways for energy to get out. So I'm going to rearrange it slightly such that we've got uh, conduction on the left-hand side of the equation and convection on the right hand. Using Fourier's law, I've got the rate at which energy is entering due to conduction is equal to negative k dt dx. And this is going to be evaluated at x. We're also going to have q leaving due to conduction is going to be also negative k dt dx, except this time it's going to be evaluated at x plus dx. And note that all of these are energy flow per unit area, so I'm going to use the notation with double prime up here just to emphasize that we're dealing with fluxes. And in this case I've got the convective flux, which is the heat transfer coefficient, multiplied by the driving force, or the temperature difference. To be able to use these three expressions, we're first going to have to uh, break our energy balance into fluxes multiplied by area. So like I mentioned earlier, for conduction we've got the cross-sectional area times the heat flux, due to conduction, minus the area, again, the cross-sectional area, minus the heat flux out due to conduction, and that's going to be equal to our uh, area for convection, which in our case is PDX. So now let's make the three substitutions for the flux entering, leaving due to conduction, and the energy leaving due to convection. So I'm going to manipulate our ex equation here first by dividing by the cross-sectional area and also dividing by the thermal conductivity and then I'm going to divide by dx. And let's also note that the two negative signs will cancel each other out. So we're going to be left with dt dx evaluated at x plus dx minus dt dx evaluated at x. And then we're going to take the limit as dx goes to zero and what that's going to result in is a second derivative of temperature with respect to x equal to the right hand side. Let's take a quick moment to check the units. On the left hand side we're going to have Kelvin per meter squared. On the right hand side we're going to have meters and the dimensions of the heat transfer coefficients, watts per meter squared Kelvin. One over the area is one over meters squared. For the thermal conductivity we're going to have meters Kelvin over watts because it's a reciprocal. And now we're going to uh, cancel out units. Let's just make sure the watts cancel out. We've also got the temperature difference so I should include that. And now I've got the meters squared squared cancel out. So on the right hand side I've got Calvin per meter squared that does equal the dimensions on the left hand side so at least we're good dimensionally. So to save on handwriting it'll become important a little bit later on I'm going to use I'm going to define a parameter m which is going to be equal to the square root of this term. So here's a second order differential equation uh, with respect to x. So we'll find that we need two boundary conditions to solve this. The general solution to this differential equation looks like this, where we have two constants of integration, C1 and C2. To arrive at those two constants of integration, we'll apply two different boundary conditions. We won't get into the specifics here, but some of the boundary conditions, you know, we could define a flux at a particular location, or we could define a temperature at a particular location. So something like this, it's often, we'll often specify, you know, the temperature we might say is equal to the temperature of the base at x equals zero. So this would be, for example, uh, our first boundary condition. Another con common boundary condition here, the second one, uh, would be equal, would say that the uh, flux due to convection at the end of this rod, negative k dt dx, is equal to zero at x equals L, for example, which might be the length of the rod itself. So we'll find that the first derivative of temperature might be equal to zero at x equals L if, for example, the end of our rod is insulated. So two different boundary conditions. Uh, in that case, you could solve for the temperature. Won't do it here. Uh, but we'll have different temperature profiles based on the two uh, boundary conditions that we're dealing with. And that will give you the temperature profile as a function of x. If you're curious as to why this expression is a solution to that differential equation, we'll first differentiate it twice. We'll come up with two different expressions. We'll uh, plug this into the left-hand side, which leaves us with this expression. And now the question is, are these two equivalent? Well, to find that out, now we'll just take our expression for temperature and plug it into the right-hand side. And in doing so, we'll find that the ambient temperature T infinity ca uh, cancels out, and we do find that our expression is the solution.